Good Friday morning to you. Big news just in time for the weekend. I'm Jim Shudo. Poppy is off today. And we begin with major news on the economy. Just into CNN. New jobs numbers for the month of July show 528,000 jobs added last month. That number double expectations. It lowers the unemployment rate to just 3.5%. CNN's Matt Egan is here to help us break down these numbers. I mean, fr frankly, the headline number, Matt, I I is a big one here, but also it shows healthy growth in several sectors of the economy. Yeah, Jim, uh, this is blockbuster growth, and mm -hmm. it's pretty remarkable. This number is going to go a long way towards shutting down this idea that the U.S. economy is already in recession. To be adding more than half a million jobs in a month, at this stage of the recovery is pretty impressive. Let me give you some context around this 528,000 job figure. This is twice as much as the consensus from economists. Not only that, but it's 200,000 more than even the most optimistic forecaster had penciled in. Two big milestones that came out of this report. The labor market has now fully recovered all of the jobs lost during COVID. Total non-farm payroll is back to February 2020 levels. The unemployment rate is now down to 3.5%. That matches the half-century low set before COVID. Again, none of this suggests an imminent or an ongoing recession. But here's the problem. A heating up jobs market is exactly the opposite of what the Federal Reserve wants right now. The Fed is trying to put out this inflation fire by cooling off the jobs market. They're worried that adding this many jobs, wages this hot, it's just not consistent with healthy inflation. And so today's numbers suggest that the Fed is actually going to have to do more to slow this economy down. And that means even potentially more aggressive interest rate hikes in the months to come. That is a concern to investors. As soon as this number came out, we saw stock futures fall pretty sharply because the market is starting to get concerned that the Fed may actually have to do even more to cool off this inflation fire. Yeah. Jim, um, I'm not able to hear you, so back to you. Matt Egan, thank you for the update. Uh, so for more on the state of the economy and what these numbers mean, I'm joined now by Austin Goolsby, the former chairman of the White House Council of Economic Advisors under President Bob Obama. He's currently a professor of economics at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. Austin, good to have you on this morning. Yeah, great to see you again, Jim. It's a big number, double expectations. Does this mean, as, as you look at this, uh, that the U.S. economy is not entering a recession? Yeah, I mean, this is a jaw-dropping number uh, of this magnitude. There has never been, it's worth, it not, not only is it double expectations, yeah. there has never been a time when the unemployment rate was this low that we're putting up numbers like this. Normally, numbers like this are reserved for times when unemployment is very high and, and you're really booming coming out of a downturn. Uh, there's no way it, it, that I could see that for the first six months of this year, when we added s several million jobs, that you could consider that a recession. Yeah. Still, if the Fed starts raising rates more, it's already raised rates at a very fast clip. That could turn around uh, in a kind of a rapid basis because yeah. eventually we're going to run out of bodies. You can't have an unemployment rate be at the 53-year low and keep adding 500,000 jobs a month. There just aren't yeah. enough people. So we could yeah. rapidly just run up a, to the wall. Yeah, I mean, we used to talk about maximum employment around 6%. So these, these numbers are remarkable historically. The Fed has already been raising rates, as you know, pretty aggressively. Does the, the, when you look at this, does the fact that the job market has remained strong, could that be an indicator, and I know this is early, that it is? perhaps engineering a soft landing here, or is it just too early to say? It's too early to say, but mm -hmm. gee, whoa, let's keep our fingers crossed that that is what it means. we got yeah. two observations in a row now. One, that job vacancies fell without an increase in, in unemployment, and now a jobs number that was extremely strong, suggesting there is a little space that they could reduce the heat in the job market without sending us into recession. Yeah. But all of this hinges on whether we're getting the positive supply shocks in the, in the language of the economists, or whether this is the inflation is coming from demand. Yeah. If you are a more of a demand person, 
then they're going to be arguing, and it seems like the market is arguing, oh, we're going to have to cool things off even even more now. Mm. Uh, but if we're getting, if what we're getting is kind of the opposite of the downturn that came from COVID, we could be in for a very nice surprise. It could be a lovely fall. Yeah, it's a good point. So many have made that is, is this idea that, you know, the inflation is really post-pandemic because of supply issues. Uh, I do want to ask, is in this, this number also showed some pretty robust wage growth, uh, I believe above 5%. Uh, d- does that potentially add to inflation figures going forward? Almost certainly. You, mm-hmm. You're never going to hear me say a bad words about a job report where we got more than yeah. half a million jobs in a single month. I hear that, you. So that said, it, it is the fact that if wages keep growing, they're not growing as fast as inflation, mm-hmm. but if they keep growing at this kind of speed, it sort of sets a lower bound on how, how much inflation can come down. Because it's hard for inflation to come down more than to, to be below wages for, for, for an extended period. So that is a danger. That's why the market is a little nervous about seeing a strong number yeah. like this because they think that means the Fed is gonna actively yeah. try to cool it down. Yeah, the market's always funny and that sometimes good news makes a, you know, tur- turns into bad news about yeah. w- where things are going. Catherine Rampell has made the point that this means that the U.S. economy has just about replaced all the jobs lost dur- during the pandemic. As an economist, uh, that period of job growth and, and the speed with which that happened, is that historically unusual? Unusual, totally unprecedented. Mm-hmm. There's never been anything like that. But that was true on the way down, too. There's never been yeah. any collapse of jobs that quickly, and there's never been a recovery of jobs as rapidly as, as we have recovered. In large part, that's probably because COVID was unlike any previous recession. I've been saying we should call it a downturn, but we shouldn't even call it a recession. It looks mm-hmm. so different from all other recessions. Yeah. But part of that is an indicator that the economy fundamentals they, they probably are still quite strong in a way that's, that's unprecedented compared to other business cycles. Yeah, the headline figure, 3.5%, just remarkable. Uh, Austin Goolsby, always good to have you on to break things down. Great to see you. Well, Secretary of State Antony Blinken is responding after Russia signaled overnight it is willing to negotiate a potential prisoner swap with the U.S. for WNBA star Brittany Griner. You'll remember just yesterday she was sentenced to nine years in prison following a guilty plea for smuggling a small amount of cannabis oil into Russia. Back at home, her WNB team, the Phoenix Mercury, held a moment of solidarity with the opposing team before last night's game, many of them becoming emotional, wiping away tears. Then Griner's coach spoke about her sentencing. To hear her, her words and her apologies and just trying to send love and prayers to her and strength. I couldn't imagine being in that situation and, and she was so courageous and, and like continuing to be a good role model in so many ways of, of this impossible situation. And she showed great strength and great humility and um, we, just, we just want our home. CNN Senior International Correspondent Fred Plykin is in Moscow. Fred, the U.S. courts had suggested a prisoner swap before her sentencing. Russia wasn't happy with that. They wanted to add a, another convicted murderer to that list, someone held in Germany. Uh, do you sense a substantive change here in those public comments from the Kremlin spokesman uh, about their openness to a swap? Mm. To a, to a certain extent, yes. I, it does seem as though there might be a little bit more momentum than we've seen before. Now, certainly a lot of that, or all of that, is probably going to be behind closed doors. But you do see the fact that, for instance, Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, says they're willing to engage with the United States in talks. That is certainly something that we hadn't heard from them before. Now, of course, all of this comes after Brittany Griner's conviction yesterday and that nine-year jail sentence that was handed down. And, you know, one of the things uh, that uh, Brittany Griner's legal team had been telling me before the verdict, even took place is they said that they believe that there needed to be a verdict and there needed to be sentencing for a possible possible prisoner swap to take place. So maybe we are seeing some momentum uh, in the wake of that. Again, it's very difficult to say, but they also said during that trial that they believe that none of the arguments that they had actually put forward in the trial, and also some of those appeals that Brittany Griner's coach was just talking about, we can see some of that on our screen just now, some of the comments that Brittany Griner made while she was in that cage yesterday. They believe that none of that was taken into account account 
by the judge when that verdict came down and when the sentencing came in. I want to listen in really quick to what the lawyers had to say after the trial. She's very upset, very upset, very stressed, and she is, well, she can hardly talk, honestly, so it's a difficult time for her. The average is five years, or around five years, and uh, almost a third of the people convicted get the uh, parole. And the lawyers told me once again today they are going to file an appeal against this verdict, but they've also been clear on the fact that they believe that at this point in time, a possible exchange is probably the most realistic way forward. And, and that brings us to the, to the diplomatic sphere, Jim, where we have seen a little bit of that men momentum. It's interesting because not only Sergei Lavrov commented, but of course the Kremlin did as well. Uh, and one of the things that Dmitry Peskov said is he said, look, uh, of course these negotiations can take place. Uh, apparently an instrument for that has already been put in place. Uh, at the summit between President Biden and President uh, Putin last year in Geneva. They put uh, forward a mechanism to deal with such cases. But he also said that none of the details of that are allowed to be public or these things simply will not take place. So expect all this to happen behind closed doors. But of course, we know the U.S. is pushing hard, Jim. Yeah, it's not unlike what you often see from Iran. Big sentence and then the negotiations start when Americans have been held there. Fred Blyken, thanks so much. New this morning, China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs is taking dramatic steps in response to House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan, including canceling future phone calls and meetings with U.S. defense leaders. All this as Taiwan reports a record number of incidents by Chinese warplanes today, as well as really alarming military exercises around the island. CNN White House reporter Natasha Bertrand and CNN correspondent Selena Wang, Wang following all the headlines. Natasha, first to you, it, it strikes me as, as, as a change from the White House approach on this, because after initially cautioning Pelosi away from this trip, you know, at least in, in private and even some of the public comments from Biden, now they seem to be saying, hey, China, you're the one who's inflaming this situation with these exercises. Exactly right. And they're making public the fact that they actually summoned the Chinese ambassador to the U.S. to the White House in order to essentially condemn what China is doing right now near Taiwan to dress him down, according mm -hmm. to National Security Council spokesperson uh, John Kirby, who told us this in a statement today. He said that they uh, brought him in to demarche him about the Chinese provocations near the island of Taiwan and how they view it as completely unacceptable. But I think that the way the White House is viewing this now is that this is a pretext by the Chinese, according to Kirby, to kind of up the ante in tension so that they can create kind of a new status quo. Mm -hmm. And the United States is saying, we're not going to accept that status quo. We are going to continue operating in the Western Pacific as we have for many, many decades. And the fact that China now is increasing its, its aggression does not mean that we are going to take the bait, does not mean that we are going to respond in kind. Mm -hmm. We do not want a crisis here. And that is why they're continuing this high level dialogue dialogue with the Chinese uh, as much as they possibly can. Jim. And when you say new status quo, a new status quo meaning China pu attempting to push U.S. forces back from, from things like going through the Taiwan Strait, that sort of thing? Essentially making it as the, uh, seem as though they now have this, uh, you know, uh, military activity around Taiwan that's going to continue, right? right. It, increase tensions and, and keep it that way, in a sense, pushing the United States yeah. out or trying to. That is what the United States is saying we're not going to yeah. accept. Addressing down. Uh, Selena Wang uh, in Beijing, t Taiwan reporting, well, a record number of incidents by the, the People's Liberation Army of China. And you see that in the pictures there. I mean, missiles launching within sight of public beaches on the coast of China. Uh, what specifically are Taiwanese officials speaking about? Well, that's right. We've learned from the Taiwanese officials that 68 Chinese warplanes flew into Taiwan's self-declared air identification zone. Now, this is the airspace around Taiwan where China frequently flies its warplanes into, but this is a record number of daily incursions. And it comes after that very escalatory news yesterday, according to Chinese state media, that Chinese missiles had actually flown over Taiwan Island, not around it, but over it. So all of these moves are part of the very inflammatory military drills happening over the course of several days that essentially encircle the island. And the message China is sending to the world is that we've got a powerful modern military that has the ability to cut Taiwan from the rest of the world. But that punishment also being extended to the U.S. We've just learned that China is 
canceling, suspending bilateral talks with the United States on a whole wide range of issues, including in military defense, in climate change, in illegal immigration, anti-drugs. And that canceling of talks and climate change is extremely critical and damaging because this was one of the only areas where the U.S. and China were still talking over the course of these past several years, despite these recent tensions. That is a major blow to the world, to the future of solving the climate crisis, Jim. Salida Wang in Beijing, Natasha Bertrand here in Washington. Thanks so much to both of you. A major legislative win for Democrats. Senator Kirsten Sinema has indicated she is ready to vote yes on the party's sweeping economic package after party leaders agreed to change some new tax proposals. Those changes include adding an excise tax on companies' stock buybacks as part of the agreement which leaves the remaining deficit figure at 300 billion. Democrats say that this is paid for. With the Arizona senator's support, Democrats will likely have the 50 votes the caucus needs to push the bill through their chamber. Just a couple weeks ago, folks thought this was dead. CNN Washington correspondent Sunland Sirfati is on Capitol Hill. So Sunland Sinnaman has said it's pending the parliamentarian's ruling. You know, it's a little in the weeds here, but basically the parliamentarian has to decide if the pieces of this legislation qualify as budget measures. I mean, how, how long do we expect before we hear a final word? Yeah, Jim, this is certainly a major hurdle that this bill has to overcome. And we could see a ruling from the Senate parliamentarian as early as today. Now, this is a process that the Senate parliamentarian goes through. It's known up here on Capitol Hill called a birdbath. And basically, she's looking at each and every provi provision in this bill, making sure that each and every one of those provisions has an impact on federal revenue, has an impact on spending, and has an impact on the deficits. And that is certainly a critical moment for Senate Democrats because they, as we've been talking about for the last weeks and months, really, they want to pass this through by the process of reconciliation, budget reconciliation. So they need this to have a favorable ruling from the parliamentarium to be able to get this through by only a simple party line vote, 50 Democrats here in the Senate. So certainly a critical moment for Democrats. And again, this is a major piece of the Biden agenda with major investments in climate, energy, health care and tax reform. And on that last part, tax provisions, that's really what Senator Sinema has in recent days expressed some concern over. And she was successful in pushing for Democrats to make some very specific changes to this bill. They dropped a $14 billion carried interest tax provision from the bill. And also they're making changes to the Democrats' plans to pare back how companies can deduct their depreciated assets from their taxes. And notably, as you mentioned at the top, um, to make make up for that lost revenue, they're adding in a 1% excise tax on stock buybacks. So certainly an important moment. The Senate will be in this weekend working. They'll be holding a procedural vote at some point this weekend, trying to push it forward in the Senate. And when and if they pass that, it's over the House for final passage of this bill. Jim. Salman Sarfati, thanks for covering. Joining me now to discuss this, senior editor for The Atlantic and CNN senior political analyst, Ron Brownstein, and Asma Khalid, she's White House correspondent for NPR. Good to have you both on. And Ron, listen, just, to, just a straight up list of the Democratic Party's legislative accomplishments. And by the way, you could call several of these bipartisan. The budget bill looks yeah. to be on track now. You, you had gun legislation, bipartisan. Uh, the CHIPS legislation got, got through this about semiconductor production in the U.S., but also NATO membership for Finland and Sweden. Uh, when you add that up, uh, how does that stand in, in previous administrations for, for getting that kind yeah. of legislation passed in that period of time? Yeah, they are on track to get a lot done. Obviously, there's a lot that Democrats care about that passed the House that got blocked in the Senate, particularly voting rights. Yeah. But when you look at what they were able to do, and as you note, on several of these with uh, uh, bipartisan support, it is a significant list. And this bill is, as Joe Biden might have once put it, a, a BFD. I mean, uh, the, the, the Medicare negotiating prescription drugs is something that Democrats have been seeking for 20 years since Part D of Medicare was created uh, under George W. Bush. It's something that could have an enormous effect on pocketbooks uh, around the country. Uh, and then the climate investments, which are the biggest uh, investments in, in transitioning to our clean energy the federal government has ever made. There are estimates it will bring down U.S. climate emissions by 40 percent, nearly enough to meet the target of 50 percent uh, by 2030. Um, and politically, uh, gives Democrats really the first, I think, positive thing they can go to young voters with and say, your vote makes 
a difference. Previously, their message to young voters was mostly negative. You know, stop Republicans yeah. from taking away your abortion rights. This is something positive, and it does add up to a significant legislative uh, a record, even with uh, many mm -hmm. party, party priorities that were still blocked by the filibuster. Asma Khalid, the, the, the number one issue for voters that you, you often seen in polling is, is the economy and inflation. And, and Bernie Sanders, of course, who caucuses with the Democrats, his criticism of this bill is that it doesn't hit the bottom line for, for, for most Americans in the way many are demanding. So some way to help them get through and over these higher prices. I mean, is that from a political standpoint with the midterms three months away, is that a miss in this budget legislation? Look, I mean, I think that Democrats do, to Ron's point, need to go out and have something concrete that they can pitch to voters. And and this is it. I mean, if you look at it, it is essentially a slimmed down version of the Build Back Better yeah. legislation that the Biden White House first put forth. But it has a new name. It's now called the Inflation Reduction Act, um, mm -hmm. namely because, you know, Democrats are acutely aware that inflation is the primary concern that voters have. Um, you know, when you talk to economic analysts, there's no expectation that this bill will in any tangible way actually um, help bring down rising costs before November. I mean, that is just not a realistic proposition, but it's a messaging strategy. And mm -hmm. I do think yeah. for Democrats, you know, it's one thing to be able to put forth legislation. Democrats have consistently struggled at being able to message those wins. That's something they struggled with for many months around uh, the infrastructure bill. And I'm curious if this is different and they're able to pitch it to voters, because that's part of it, not just patching, passing it, but pitching it. Yeah, Ron, Ron the, the, the sort of contradiction in the midst of this, right, is, is you have President Biden achieving many of his legislative goals, in some cases against the odds in recent months. I mean, if we were talking two weeks ago, we would have said, you know, any version of Build Back Better was dead. But at the same time, you have, you have Democrats, certainly privately, but more and more openly questioning whether Joe Biden should even run for president in 2024. Rick, Rick Wilson of the Lincoln uh, Project, it, he, he tweeted about this earlier today saying, Quoting him here, Jesus, Democrats can't organize a two-car motorcade, but they can't, sure can turn the guns on the leader of their party 90 days before an election. I, I wonder, do you agree with that criticism here that, that the, the, the party surprisingly is not rallying around the president in the midst of this? Well, look, I think the 2024 conversation is real. It has a lot to do with uh, uh, Biden's age. And I don't think that's going away no matter what legislative achievements he have. The more the more immediate question, the more immediate problem, Jim, is that Biden's approval rating among Democrats had fallen, yeah. Democratic voters had fallen below 80 percent. And that threatens to compound, compound what is yeah. the typical uh, effect going back for 150 years where the party out of power is already m usually more motivated to vote in a midterm election than the party uh, that holds the White House. And I do think this achievement does have the potential to restore faith in the near term, leaving aside 2024, among some Democrats, particularly younger Democrats. I mean, his approval numbers among young voters have been yeah. terrible. Uh, and mm -hmm. this is something that is a big prior. For Can I also put one plant one flag in the ground. All of this reminds me of what Barack Obama was able to do in 2012 with the auto bailout. And I think when you look at the combined effect of the investments in this bill, encouraging domestic manufacturing, the infrastructure investments and the semiconductor bill, encouraging mm -hmm. domestic manufacturing, I think you're going to see Biden or whoever is the Democratic nominee in 2024 going to rusted out industrial communities and yeah. making the case that we have invested in your prosperity in the same way Obama was able yeah. to do across the Midwest with the bailout in 2012. Listen, a lot's happening. No question. Ron Brownstein and Asma Hala, good to have you both on. Look forward to having you back soon. Coming up next. Now to our exclusive CNN reporting. Former President Donald Trump's lawyers are now in direct talks with the Justice Department about its ongoing criminal investigation into the January 6th insurrection. The talks are said to be focused on whether conversations the former president had can be kept from investigators under Trump's broad claims of executive privilege. CNN senior crime and justice reporter Caitlin Pol Polins joins me now. Uh, what do we know about the substance of these conversations and, and what position Trump and his lawyers are taking? Well, Jim, what we really know here is this is for the first time we're able to confirm that they're talking. At right. very least, the Justice Department and Donald Trump's defense team. And the reason that this is happening, this is coming in amid all of this grand jury activity that we're seeing in this criminal investigation being run out of D.C., in that grand jury activity, we know there are some top witnesses from the Trump White House and from 
Vice President Mike Pence's office who've either been into the grand jury to testify or have been subpoenaed to come in and testify. So that's two people from the vice president's office and then the two Pats from the White House Counsel Office, Cipollone and Philbin. So when they're coming in to testify, they're sharing what they know, but we know that they are not able to share everything that right. they witnessed, specifically things that Trump would have said or may have been said to Trump as advice. Uh, and Donald Trump and his people, they still want to protect those statements. And so that's what this conversation is about. Prosecutors want access to more about what Donald Trump was saying. So it's this fight over executive mm -hmm. privilege. That's where the, the, that comes in. And when we asked for comment about the news of these mm -hmm. direct talks, we went to Trump's team. Yeah. A spokes spokesperson came back to us, did not give us a direct answer. Instead, they gave us a preview mm -hmm. of what their legal argument may be. They said, how can any future president ever have private conversations with his attorneys, counselors, and other senior advisors if if any such advisor is forced basically to reveal those privileged confidential discussions even potentially after the president sees. So that's very likely what Trump's team is saying to the Justice Department right now. And of course, the Justice Department has history on its side here. This came up in the Nixon investigation, yeah. Watergate. It's the Justice Department won. They got the tapes of the Watergate released to the grand jury that ushered in uh, Nixon's resignation yeah. just a few days later different Supreme Court now, though. That's true. We could end up there. Caitlin Polans, thanks so much. Joining me now to discuss former U.S. Attorney Michael Moore, now a partner at Moore Hall Law Firm in Atlanta. Michael, good, good to have you. I mean, to Caitlin's point, I thought this was settled post Watergate, that, that the executive privilege claims cannot extend it into criminal investigations in, in the simplest terms here. Why is this still an open argument and how far do you and how long do you see it going? Well, I'm glad to be with you, Jim, and you're right. Uh, under the old Supreme Court cases, the, during the Nixon days, the, the, the rule was that you can't use executive privilege basically as a shield to protect you from a, a criminal case. Um, and so here, it's a little bit different because we've had this ongoing uh, inquiry into both political activities, as we've seen uh, through the January 6th case, uh, and, and now the investigation on the, on, on the Hill, uh, and, and now into the into the grand jury probe. And so I, I actually agree with some of the arguments being made by Trump's attorneys, and that is, you know, executive privilege is a necessity. We want presidents. Forget about Trump. I mean, mm -hmm. let's just take him and set him aside. We want presidents of the future to be able to seek advice from people uh, in a candid way without having to worry about whether or not uh, those, those people may ultimately be called before a grand jury, a congressional committee, or otherwise to talk about the deliberative process. The problem here is that the norms have just changed, uh, right? We, we're, we're now seeing something where we're talking about a, a president being uh, in, possibly indicted. Uh, we're talking about whether or not uh, there was a, an effort to overthrow the, the government and, the, and, and uh, overturn an election. These, these are different days. You're right, though, that the Supreme Court is different. Uh, and, and you may find them, as, as we've seen, taking very different terms and, and paying very little yeah. attention to, to precedent in, in, in cases from, uh, from before. So to that point, Brett Kavanaugh, in, in a decision earlier this year, uh, when the court did require uh, the former president to turn over written records to the National Archives, he did say, quoting from that decision, a former president must be able to successfully invoke the presidential communications privilege for communications that occurred during his presidency, even if the current president does not support the privilege claim. He does go on to qualify that to some degree to say, to be clear, to say that a former president can invoke the privilege uh, for presidential communications that occur during his presidency does not mean that privilege is absolute or cannot be overcome. But I wonder, as you, you know this court pretty well, and as you hear a statement like that, and you know, by the way, there are, there are members of this court who are to the right of Brett Kavanaugh. Do you see the path here for Trump lawyers, right, to go to the court and maybe get a friendly decision? I wouldn't be surprised at all if they got a friendly decision, uh, especially when we're talking about direct communications with White House counsel. And that's what's really spurred this on. There's been this flurry of activity, and the Democrats, frankly, have just gotten very excited thinking that because White House counsel has been subpoenaed to testify before the grand jury, that they must be getting all the dirt now on Trump and that he's sure to be indicted. I would say just take a step back, take a pause. I mean, that, that's a little bit like getting a pimple and then self-diagnosing yourself as having leprosy. I mean, this is just the first thing. I mean, this is one little indicator that the investigation is moving forward. It, it's, it's going to be important, and these witnesses would be expected witnesses under any circumstance because they really had a front row seat to the action. Whether we're talking about Trump, whether we're talking about uh, the, the other lawyers that were involved, Sidney Powell, uh, Rudy Giuliani, 
uh, Mark Meadows, whoever we're talking about that yeah. may have been in there is, is helping develop this scheme and this plan. So this, these are expected witnesses. Doesn't mean they have the silver bullet to the case. So the fact that there are these discussions going on, I think it would be malpractice for Trump's team not to do it because they know that there are things that are out there that they want to protect. Now, does that mean at the end of the day, they'll be able to hide behind executive privilege? We'll see what the court says. But again, these are different mm -hmm. discussions when we're talking about uh, communications between a president mm -hmm. and, and White House cabinet, as opposed to necessarily just another cabinet member. Uh, and, you know, a president may be just the secretary of the state in a cer yeah. circumstance like this. The, the lawyers giving him advice about what, what to do and what they think. Michael Moore, we'll see how it plays out. Thanks very much. Great to be with you, Jim. Thank you. Coming up next, uh, a tragedy and criminal defense attorney Joey Jackson. Jo Joey, good to have you back. Uh, the parents had asked for up to 150 million. They got four. Paul Callan made the point to me last night that, that the jurors are aware that other Sandy Hook parents uh, are suing and that this may be an effort to, to, to parcel out the money and, in effect, leave some for them. And I wonder if that makes sense to you. Yeah, Jim, good morning to you. Uh, I think my uh, good friend Paul Callan has it right. I think that in assessing this case, right, you have to look at not only in this jurisdiction, Texas, but you have to look at what the other families are enduring. We know that there are two pending lawsuits in Connecticut. And so certainly uh, Alex Jones has made claims as to the limitations of his the monies he has available. And in the event that you issue an award that's so excessive, we already know he's filed for bankruptcy in an effort to protect himself from further liability. What would that do? And the jury certainly could have been of mind to think about that. Hey, if we award something that is so excessive and he's already protecting assets, could it foreclose the parties in Connecticut that are suing him? So that certainly makes sense. Right. But we do know, notwithstanding that, Jim, that they're moving on today to decide the issue of punitive. And just very quickly, I think it's important to, to talk about the distinction. Compensatory damages are designed to compensate you. Oop. We lost Joe, Joey Jackson there. He was making the point. He was making the point that there are two phases to this jury trial. The first, uh, compensatory damages that already decided. The jury is deciding today on punitive damages. Uh, which they could impose on Alex Jones as well. Uh, we will keep on top of that story. We'll get Joey back when we can. If